So welcome back. My name is Angus Dawson. I'm Professor of Bioethics here at the Centre for Biomedical Ethics at the National University of Singapore. And today I'm going to be talking about issues related to possible solutions to some of the issues that we have faced when discussing our key example to do with the association between obesity and various different chronic diseases. What's going to be important here is thinking about addressing how we respond to these um, questions. I'm assuming that we see this as being a potential health problem that we need to address. And if we look back to some of the definitions of public health, of course, um, there were those two different ideas about the idea of public, and we can see these in the kinds of solutions that I'm going to suggest here. The first one is thinking about the population side of health itself. And the second is that um, thinking about the role of collective action in addressing that particular question. So we might think about the problem here as being one of growing rates of obesity. Let's assume that it's clear that that is associated with various poorer um, health outcomes related to various chronic diseases, well, and we wish to address them. Then the question becomes, how do we effectively improve population health in relation to this particular um, set of conditions? And what is the best way of going about um, responding to that? And what I want to suggest is that there are at least three different ways that we might seek to um, move in a particular direction. All three of these might be overlapping and important in playing a role in relation to uh, addressing these particular problems. All three of these might be possible areas for the development of different solutions to the issue. Many of these solutions are then going to pick up on some of the values that I talked about in video three, where we explored the contrast between a liberal approach looking towards the same kinds of values that we see often used in exploring issues in clinical care and then applying them within public health, and where I contrasted that approach with a different one that looked to what I call these socially embedded values. So the three different um, ideas here, the first one is community action. And why I want to suggest that this is one possible area of exploring solutions is picking up on this idea about how um, human flourishing is something which is not just an individual activity, but is often something that is um, actually provided by thinking about action within a community itself. So actually um, reducing tensions within a community and exploring ways and opportunities that there might be to, perf perf to perform various actions together as um, individuals within a community is an important way to um, raise some questions about addressing these solutions. So for example, it might be that there are various kinds of reasons to look at ways that within a community context, we might have opportunities to encourage people to exercise. Do we make it easier for people to walk or cycle um, rather than driving around? Do, they, do we provide good public transport? That means that people um, are less dependent upon uh, cars. Can we think about ways to actually, within a community context, actually bring people together to eat more healthily? Are there opportunities to think about, for example, developing community gardens where people can um, garden together and grow fresh vegetables that might then be an important part of their diet? There are all kinds of advantages that might come from that, such as children learning more about where um, vegetables come from, how they are grown, and how 
they can be integrated within a, um, a balanced diet. So there's a, a, a large um, set of opportunities here, I think particularly within communities which provide already a culture which is more orientated towards a more um, community way of thinking about things rather than an individualistic way. The second way of thinking about possible solutions, a second air area of activity, is thinking about health systems as a whole and how we might actually encourage ideas about prevention within them. Are there opportunities for more uh, prevention within the kind of more clinical context? We don't, of course, want to, on the approach I've been suggesting here, wait for people to develop conditions and then focus on, on treatment. Essentially, if you took a, a whole of uh, systems approach to thinking about chronic disease related to obesity, then we're actually thinking about interventions that push action, activity and funding, of course, uh, upstream. We focus on funding activities within a health system to prevent harms from actually emerging rather than waiting for them to develop and then treating them. Many different um, health systems are now taking this idea seriously and looking at different ways that we might intervene to um, focus more upon prevention within communities. And this might actually link up with my first general area of activity. And the last area of activity here is essentially government action. And here the thought might be that there's actually a set of obligations that a government is, is under to protect and support the population as a whole. When we looked at the complexity diagram in relation to the causal story in relation to obesity, if we take that seriously, thinking about how health choices in relation to food are impacted by all kinds of other policies, then there is an argument for government to be key when it comes to thinking about its responsibility in terms of um, protecting and supporting people within the population. And of course, the government has a crucial role here in relation to thinking about how the actions of the law and the development of different kinds of regulations might actually play a role in encouraging the right kinds of policies that impact positively here, or thinking about ways to uh, reduce ways of acting that might actually impact negatively upon people's health. Now, of course, there is an important issue to do with making sure that the, um, any government is not merely imposing its will without any discussion upon the people. Very often, people that are opposed to the kinds of government action that I am suggesting here appeal to this idea of legitimacy of decision making. But there's no reason to think why any government can't actually actively engage with its citizens and um, explore reasons, such as the reasons I've been giving through this series of videos, for why we might not have this approach which is more focused on population health and the advantages, the efficiency uh, of that kind of approach for individuals as well as communities. Now one common objection that, that we have particularly to this role of, of governments, perhaps there's less objection particularly to ideas about community action, assuming that they are independent of government, is this thought that again goes back to um, one of the accounts of health promotion ethics that I was talking about in video three. There you'll rem remember there was this idea of um, being a good liberal and remaining detached from um, trying to seek to change the choices or preferences of individuals. So on that 
thin autonomy approach, the idea is that we might object to government action here by suggesting that um, governments ought to be neutral. That ideas about what counts as a good life are contested and that it's not for the government to um, suggest one particular way of thinking about these questions. Now, of course, we can respond to that and say this idea of neutrality is something that we might question. What does it actually mean for a state to be neutral? Is that even possible? If by neutral it's meant not intervening in any kind of way, then we could argue that that then comes into tension with government's responsibility to perform a role in supporting the citizens of that particular country. But it's also a kind of paradox here because essentially by being neutral, that in turn will have consequences for the health of the people. Essentially, it might mean that there is a um, more of a market approach to the developments within that particular community. And as a consequence, it might mean that individuals are left to defend themselves against the, the forces that operate within that particular community. Essentially, it can be very difficult for individuals to um, respond when it comes to things like uh, marketing, advertising of particular kinds of food stuff, which might turn out to be unhealthy. So this response is basically suggesting that there might be a role for governments to actually regulate the way that food companies, for example, fast food companies actually advertise their, their products. More generally here is perhaps a thought about how there has been a suggestion in everything that I've been saying in the last uh, couple of videos that when we think about the conditions for a flourishing life, again thinking about the conditions for public health, going back to the first video and the definitions of public health that we looked at, there's a reason to see that actually there are um, maybe things can be disputed, but there will be clear objective features as to what might count as a good and flourishing life. So generally speaking, the kinds of um, flourishing of individuals is something that occurs within a community and a societal context. And there are um, good reasons to think that the way that we best respond to the kinds of issues at the population level that impact upon our health is to approach them at the population level. And that is something that we have no reason to think that the government ought to be neutral about. So I just wanted to end by saying that, of course, the kind of approach that's taken here will be contentious and many people will object and the supporters of the, what I was talking um, before as being the liberal approach to these things, with a focus on autonomy, are going to object. But of course, there's no reason to see why, if there is a genuine autonomous choice to adopt a particular unhealthy lifestyle, people are actually free to do that. So everything that I've said um, so far, there is nothing here about uh, banning particular foodstuffs or anything like that. So I'll just end with some uh, conclusions. I'm assuming here that we have reasons to believe and accept the correlation between obesity and some particular risks related to chronic disease. I'm assuming that most people are going to be interested in effective action and that it's better to actually um, prevent that harm from emerging rather than waiting for that to happen and then focusing on treatment. If we are interested in effective action, then we are going to have to look towards the collective interventions because it is very difficult for all individuals to um, be involved in terms of 
thinking about making autonomous choices given the kinds of influences that there are in society. And I've suggested that it is ethically justified to actually focus on these collective interventions as a way of responding to the particular association between chronic diseases and obesity as a way for us to uh, flourish together as being the best way to address these kinds of considerations rather than being left to tackle these issues alone. So thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this series of videos and I'll stop here.